My name is Joshua Enns, uh, and as many as you know, I'm attending SBC, and Pastor Jared has allowed me to preach today as a part of a service learning activity. And I also want to thank you guys for uh, allowing me to preach, and also for the su support that I've gotten. Many have come to me and said, you're praying for me, and I really appreciate that. So next weekend is Easter weekend, and uh, this week is sometimes referred to as Holy Week. And what we're going to have next weekend, and also on Thursday, we have a Monday survey, Thursday service, we're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, this probably is pretty obvious. Uh, some of you may have been here for a while, and you've probably heard Ch Pastor Jared say something like, if Jesus is the answer, what is the question? Or if Jesus is the solution, what's the problem? Well, this week, I'm asking the question. And the question is, why do we need the gospel? What do we need to be saved from? Now, there's a few reasons why I think it's important that we talk about this. The first one is that we're often told by our culture that we are inherently good, that there's good within uh, every person. But the Bible presents us as something different. In fact, completely opposite. And I think we need to continue to reframe our mindset and making sure that we understand our need for a savior. Another reason is that we need to set up our hearts to hear the answer of the gospel. Without knowing why we need to be saved, we won't understand why it's so significant. The more we see our need, the more precious the fulfillment of that need will become. Or to say it another way, the greater our gap between us and God, the more awesome the gospel that bridges that gap will become. And the last reason is how we define a problem determines the type of answer that we're going to give. So, if you have your Bibles, open with me to Romans chapter 3. We're going to be reading verses 9 to 20 of Romans 3. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, no, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you that we know what the gospel is, and we pray that you would help us to see ourselves clearly, uh, see what the problem is uh, that propelled you to bring your Savior to the world, or your Son to the world to save us. We thank you that we know the answer, and we pray that you'd help us to uh, realize the depth of our sin, and to be humbled by it, and uh, thus to give you glory uh, for the answer that you gave. I pray that you'd be working in all of us with your spirit, uh, me and also the congregation, that you'd be applying the message to our hearts. We pray this in your name, amen. So one of the hardest parts about doing what I'm doing, which is just a one-off sermon, is that we jump into the middle of a conversation. Now, before we go into Romans 3, uh, we need to establish the context uh, of the passage to show the argument. We do this because context determines meaning. The larger picture enlightens the smaller picture. Now, imagine receiving a letter in the mail that was, say, 10 pages long, 
and you took page three out and read half of page three, I think it would be pretty hard to understand what that letter is talking about. So how would you understand it? Well, you'd look at who wrote it, where, where did it come from. You'd probably see some sort of heading or some sort of stamp from a company that brought it to you or sent it to you. Or you're also expecting a letter. You know the context of your life. Uh, so for example, if you saw a camera flash the last time you were in the city driving too fast, well, you won't be surprised to see a letter in the R from the RCMP in the mail very soon. Now, we need to do the same thing when we come to the Bible. We want to establish the context. Uh, we can't jump into the middle of a conversation and expect to know what's happening. So, I'm going to try and do that as best I can. Uh, so, if you still have your Bibles open there, let's just go to the beginning of the book of Romans. I'm going to give you a little bit of background information. So, the first thing is, it's a letter. So, it's written to a historical church by Paul. Uh, it's written sometime during the late 50s, and this is about 25 years after the resurrection of Christ. The letters, uh, the church is written, or the letters written to Rome, sorry, and it was a mixed church of both Jews and Gentiles, and Gentiles are probably the majority group in the church. The overarching theme of Romans could be phrased as something like this. This is what I came up with. Romans is about God's power to save by means of the righteous one, Jesus, dying on behalf of the unrighteous, thus resulting in his righteousness coming as a free gift of God to be received by faith alone. So that's a bit of a long sentence, but it's basically God sent Christ to die on our behalf uh, that we would receive his righteousness. Now inside this theme and throughout the book, uh, Paul's also dealing with the Jew-Gentile division. So that was a big deal in the early church. So he's always talking about uh, to the Jew first, also to the Gentile, and he's addressing both groups. So that's just a good thing to keep in mind as we're going through this. Uh, our passage and study, chapter 3, 9 to, 9 to 20, we're entering into the conclusion of one of the first parts of Romans. So we're kind of at the end uh, of a conversation. The first half of chapter 1 of Romans sets up the theme and the main point of the book, especially verses 16 and 17. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So as you saw there, and as is typical throughout the book of Romans, one of the main issues is righteousness. Uh, we're dealing with the righteousness of God and comparing and contrasting that to the unrighteousness of humans. And so the natural question that comes is, how do God and humans relate to each other? And also, as you saw there as well, Paul is dealing with the Jew and Gentile divide within the Roman church. Now, the second half of chapter 1 starts the conversation that ends in our passage. And it's basically this whole thing about, uh, well, Douglas Moo, he titles this section, The Universal Reign of Sin. Not talking rain as in the weather forecast, but rain as in kingdom rain. So, unrighteousness, you see that right away is in chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. This is pretty much a summary statement of what's going to happen in the next three chapters. Uh, an interesting thing to notice in chapter 1 is it's always talking about them. So the, un, uh, the unrighteousness of them, uh, verse 24, God gave them. And so it, it kind of gives this feeling that he's talking to someone else. So when you're reading the letter, you don't ne necessarily assume that you're a part of this group. But then what happens in chapter 2, you look at verse 1 and it says, Therefore, you have no excuse. And in verse 17, we see here that Paul is actually talking to the Jews. So it seems like in the beginning, maybe he was referring more to Gentiles, even though he is including everyone in this group. Uh, in chapter 2, he makes it very clear that Jews, you're also a part of this. So his main point in chapter 2 there is that 
the doers of the law will be justified, as in the people who fulfill the law will be justified. Evildoers will be judged, and if you do sufficient good, you'll be given life. But the problem is, no one actually meets that criteria. And so at the end of chapter 2, Paul's summarizing that being a part of God's people has always been about the inward circumcision of the heart, and not physical circumcision. This argument is developed in chapter 4 and later in chapter 9, uh, which maybe you can read this week. Paul summarizes this section with chapter 3, verse 9, which is just entering into the passage that we want to focus on today. And what I think he's doing here is he's leveling the playing field. He's putting everyone on the same plane. And he says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all are under sin. Uh, Now this question here, uh, are we Jews any better off? You might have a little footnote in your Bible, if you can see the fine print. Uh, it, It says, or at any disadvantage. Now this struck me as a bit odd at first, and it's almost contradictory. Are you better or at a disadvantage? But the main point here is just to ask, do Jews surpass Gentiles in any way? And Paul's, he's kind of gone back and forth in these first three chapters, and he said, well, yes, and, but also no. And he says, yes, they're better off because they've been entrusted with the oracles of God, but no, they're not better off because they're also under sin, just like the Gentiles are. So the conclusion is the Jews, God's people, and the Gentiles are also under sin. Now, it's significant to note that in verse 9 here, Paul does not say that all sin, nor that all are sinners. He says that they are under sin. I think he's trying to emphasize that people are under the power of sin, or under the reign of sin, or in slavery to sin. And this is emphasized in John 8, where Jesus, he just says plainly, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now you may be asking, why is this important to emphasize? Why am I spending so much time on this? Uh, Douglas Moo, I saw in, in his commentary, he answers this question. He says, our understanding of someone's problem dictates the answer to that problem. For example, many of the great philosophers and moral teachers in the history of the world have been convinced that the basic problem of human beings is that they're ignorant. So if they're ignorant, what's the solution? Knowledge. That is, teach people, and they'll be made into better people, and the problems of the world would disappear. Now, in this case, the problem is that people are addicted to sinning, in slavery to sin, and unable to free themselves. Because of this, no one under the law will be declared righteous. So the question becomes, how can one be declared righteous before God when they are in slavery to rebelling against him. It's quite the problem. Now, the answer to that problem has to, d- to address these issues, and I'm going to answer this later in the passage, and we're going to come back to it. Now, moving on to verse 10 through 18, uh, you'll see that the formatting in your Bible is probably a bit different. These are Old Testament quotes, and it's just a string of Old Testament quotes Uh, And it's actually the longest one in the New Testament. So Paul's presenting timeless truths, and he's using the Old Testament to show that it's always been this way. So I want to give an overview first of all the verses, and then I'll go into them a little bit more in detail. So the list starts with violations of the first command, which is the universal sin of not recognizing God as the one and only being worthy of worship. Verses 13 to 14 then focus on the sins of speech, and Paul uses a different organ as an example each time. And verses 15 to 17 continue with the violations of the second table of the law, which is the failure to love your neighbor as yourself. And verse 18 uh, summarizes the main idea, that being that there is no fear of God in humans. So these Old Testament texts, uh, there are a bunch of different ones. They mostly come from the Psalms, uh, a little bit from Isaiah, 
and Proverbs may be alluded to, is what commentators say. Uh, in the verses quoted, most often it's the enemies of Israel portrayed. So if you go back to the psalm and you read what Paul is quoting, uh, you'll notice that it's not talking about all people, it's talking about the enemies of Israel or people that are uh, putting Israel into bondage. And also often the justice and the righteousness of God are in question in the psalms as well there. Now, the wicked portrayed in the psalms, uh, even though they are outside of ethnic Israel, Paul's actually applying these statements to his audience, all Jews and all Gentiles. So what are we to conclude from this observation? Well, some scholars think that this proves that Paul is actually referring to only unrighteous Jews, that he's not applying this to everyone. But a more likely explanation is that Paul deliberately chose to take his words from these contexts in order to make a subtle but important point. In light of Christ, all Jews must now be considered to be in the category of the wicked. Now, the original readers of Romans would be well aware that the words that Paul quotes apply only to the wicked because they will have been familiar with their Bible, which is our Old Testament. And they may well have wondered at first about how Paul can apply this to all Jews. But then they would realize that Paul is actually making a rhetorical point. He's saying, all Jews, along with all Gentiles, are unrighteous. Now, to underscore this point, uh, I think it's pretty clear if we look at the first three verses that Paul's quoting. There's seven absolute statements in these verses. Uh, absolute being either an all statement or a none statement. So seven times he's saying, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. No one does good, not even one. So I think it's pretty clear and Paul's trying to get across the message, this is everyone. No one's excused. Now, let's go into a little bit more detail in verses 10 to 12. This is the longest quote here from Psalm 14, verses 1 to 3. Now, if you want, keep a finger in Romans and flip over to Psalm 14. That's the, the first portion that he's quoting there. Now, in the context of this psalm, the fool that it talks about in the psalm was probably echoing in the minds of the readers of Romans. So in Psalm 14, it reads, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Notice that Paul changed the wording from the Lord looks down from heaven to see if there are any who understand, and he just made the conclusion that no one understands. His emphasis here is that no one understands the spiritual truth about God, and thus they do not seek him. Now this, as I said before, is a violation of the first command. The turning away from God and giving glory to lesser things. And this is probably a reference to the sin spoken of in the first chapter of Romans, where they exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. People knew God through the creation that he made, and instead of giving glory to him, they praised and subjected themselves to the creation rather than the creator. Now, verses 13 to 14 are from two other psalms, and this is the sins of speech section. Uh, so he, or Paul talks about four different organs, the throat, the tongue, the lips, and the mouth. And he's outlining that this is a very important part when you're looking at the sinfulness of mankind. And I think since Paul spends so much time uh, in this area, the mouth area, I think it would also be helpful for us to spend time there too and just think about how much time the sin in your life is caused by your mouth. He compares the throat to an open grave, which is a pretty gross comparison. 
Uh, and this probably had an even stronger impact to, to Jews. Uh, if you remember in the law, death was associated with uncleanness. And the tongue, he says, it deceives. And the tongue, if you've read James before, you probably remember that the tongue is compared to being set on fire by hell, which is, again, just crazy strong metaphors uh, that I don't think that we can overemphasize. Uh, the lips are compared to the poison of snakes, which cause severe pain and sometimes death. And the mouth is compared to being full of curses and bitterness. Verses 15 to 17, this is the, the final section, where they're talking about the intentional violence that is done to someone's neighbor. And the emphasis is quite clear as to what happens when people do not understand and seek God. And we could say that verses 10 and 11 show the foundation of the rest of the list, which outlines the results. So the difference about this Old Testament quotation from Isaiah is that Israel is actually the sinful one in the passage, whereas in all the other passages, they're saying, save us, O Lord, from them. And now in this passage, it's actually Israel that's being condemned for being unrighteousness, or for being unrighteous, sorry. And as a result, uh, in Isaiah passage there, it says, justice, righteousness, and salvation are all far away. And verse 18 uh, again, as we said before, it's a summary. Returning to the main problem, the wicked one has no fear of God. Now, this raises a practical question, uh, probably in some of your minds, and it did in mine as well. What about unbelievers that we know that do good things, right? Unbelievers start all kinds of humanitarian aid, and we know that those things are good. Social justice are good things to do. So what about them? Well, I think the first principle that we need to establish is that we must let Scripture interpret experience and not let experience to interpret Scripture. Now, if we use that lens, uh, we have to conclude that even acts that we think are good or holy or righteous, they're not actually righteous in God's eyes. Now, why? Well, I think we just need to keep reading in verse 10 and 11. Why is no one righteous? Because no one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. And when it says, no one does good, uh, it's actually a continual aspect that it's talking about. So it's saying, no one is continually doing good. Or if you want to put it the other way around, everyone is continually doing non-good or bad or unrighteous. So we can conclude that even the most noble philanthropic acts that appear good in our eyes, they're actually coming out of a heart that's rebelling against God. And that's an unrighteous act in God's eyes. And Paul makes the same point in Romans 14 at the end of the chapter. He says, uh, this paraphrase, any act that is done without faith in God and for the glory of God is sinful against God. So let me summarize the final two verses, 19 and 20. The law condemns those who are under it. And I think it shows us this in two ways. The first way is that the law brings people under the accountability of God. I came across one guy who said that a better translation, whether you agree with him or not, would be that the whole world uh, may be held guilty before God. So he wants to emphasize that it's not just that you're accountable, but you're actually guilty. And I think this makes a lot of sense com considering the context. And therefore, since you've been uh, judged guilty before God, you are subject to God's holy wrath and to be sentenced to eternal destruction. And the second reason is that no human being will be justified under the law. The logic is pretty simple. It's, since you knew the law and you didn't obey, you knew your sin. Uh, this made me think of something maybe kind of silly, but... Sometimes you see these signs called keep off grass. And for me, and I'm sure this doesn't happen to anyone else, it makes me want to just go and lie down on the grass. It just, I don't know, it just happens to do that. And I think this is kind of what uh, Paul is saying. He's saying there was a sign, and it was the law, and it said do this, don't do this, and you sinned against it. And so the purpose of the law 
is to make you vividly aware of how short you fall before God's perfect requirements. And Paul uh, expands on this in Romans 7. So if you want to go read that this week as well, in fact, you can just read the rest of the book. Now, remember, I, this, this is probably kind of depressing at some points, and I get that, and, and I felt that as I was writing it. But I keep saying, under the law. Right? Every time I talk about this, I'm saying, under the law. So the question, how can sim- sinful human beings be justified before God? Well, here's one thing we know that won't help. Uh, that's something within us. So nothing that humans can provide uh, are going to help us be justified before God because, uh, as Paul said, we need perfect righteousness. Only perfection will do. And by works of the law, no human being will be justified. And therefore, what we need is a foreign or alien, however you want to say it, righteousness. We need a righteousness that comes from outside of us. I think this is freeing. Why? Because we know the solution. We're not stuck in Romans 3.20 saying, what are we going to do? We know, what's, we know what's happening. We know what's going to happen. But if we didn't know anything after Romans 3.20, we would have to conclude that all people are in helpless slavery to sin. All people are destined to just, just lay perish eternally for their sins against the only eternal God. Now, we can thank the Lord and say hallelujah because we know that this is not where God leaves us. Now, this is freeing news because you can be confident that you contribute 0% to your salvation. There's no option or smidgen of hope within ourselves to be saved, and it's freeing because you don't have to work for it because you can't. So, where is the solution? I will go into that a little bit now. I want us to get a taste of the beauty that awaits us on Thursday and next Sunday. Now, the question that I asked before was, how can someone be declared righteous before God when they're in slavery to rebelling against him? So there's two problems in that question. One is we are unrighteous, and two, we're slaves to sin. I'm going to read verse 21 and 22 of chapter 3. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. I hope that does something for you. That got me very excited when I was uh, preparing this because I had spent so much time in Romans 3, 9 to 20 just dwelling on sin. And now it's but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. So the first problem, we are unrighteous. We see here in this verse that God has taken action to redeem his righteousness apart from the law. This is the alien righteousness that I talked about before. And God did this by sending the word, Jesus, who became flesh. He required perfect righteousness, which was, a, which was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And through his atonement for the sin of his people, the church, we are no longer under God's wrath because we receive, by faith, the righteousness of Christ. This is shown concisely in 2 Corinthians 5, where it says, For our sake God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The second problem was we're slaves to sin. So how does uh, the gospel answer that? Well, I think this is addressed later in Romans. There's lots of answers that I could give. But one is that we are crucified with Christ and later raised by him into new life. This is called regeneration by the Holy Spirit. It's a quickening, a spiritual awakening. And God has provided both of these solutions in the gospel And he sent his spirit to apply the work of Christ through the preaching of the gospel. Now, I know we want to go on and we want to explore that a bit more. uh, But we're actually being intentional today. And we're going to sit in this passage, Romans 3, 9 to 20, until Thursday, for those who come to the service anyway. And we want to ponder our deep need, our status prior to the gospel 
our amazing salvation. I want to bring this passage to a close and kind of draw up some uh, implications here. So I kind of already said this, but in the Romans 3, 9 to 20 world, if there is salvation, we know that it must be fully accomplished by God's grace. We contribute nothing. This is because the law must be fulfilled perfectly in order to have salvation. But all are under the power of sin and help us to save themselves. And thus, we know that we need something outside of ourselves. Number two, how do we look at those who are outside of the church? I often hear to people, uh, unbelievers, referred to as spiritual seekers. Now, is this accurate? I don't think so, according to, according to this passage that we just read. It said, no one seeks for God. No one understands. They have turned aside. So I would say that any amount of desire or seeking for God that someone has is a gift of grace. I think we would do well to recognize people outside of the church as Scripture does. Now, one thing that we said before is that a problem, what the problem is, determines the solution. Well, spiritual seekers uh, makes it seem like they have a small problem, and that is just that they're ignorant. They're seeking for God, but they just don't know where to find Him. And so, I would say a small problem calls for a small solution. However, if we think of them more as Romans 3 does, not seeking, not understanding, uh, turning aside, I think we're going to be more motivated to pray for them uh, and to pray specifically that God would shed the light of the gospel onto their blind eyes. I think this is very well uh, ex uh, exhibited in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 to 6. I'll just quickly paraphrase it. It says, God enlightens the blind to see the gospel, which is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So let us pray earnestly for those that we know that do not see this glory. Let us pray for the Spirit to do his work, remembering it is not ours to convert. Our job is to obey the command of God, utilizing his means to enlighten the eyes of the dead and blind, which is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number three, in the struggle against sin and temptation, I don't think the solution is to try harder because we cannot win. We fail. We cannot beat Satan in the spiritual struggle. Finding power within yourself will always lead to defeat. However, there is one who has conquered. Christ has won, defeated temptation, defeated Satan, and in faith, his victory can become ours. By the Spirit, we are enabled to put to death the deeds of the body. I think Paul demonstrates one of the biggest growing areas for sin to thrive in is the mouth. So I would challenge us all to pay attention to our mouths, to the words that come out. Are they descriptive of what Paul said here in, in this passage? Are they words of cursing and bitterness? Or are they words of blessing? Are they words that build up the body, or do they tear down and destroy? Now again, when you discover the sin that dwells inside, because I'm sure it will be uh, easy to discover that not all of our words uh, are as they should be, I challenge you to strive to put that sin to death by submitting yourself to the victory that Christ has won. Uh, second last thing, looking back from this side of the cross, let us dwell on the loving mercy of God to save us from the state that we were in. Let us thank him for his willingness to cross that vast chasm that separated us from him. He provided the righteous requirements of the law. He satisfied his own demands for perfection. And now he's called his people out of darkness and death and into light and life. And so if you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and if you stand in reverent fear of the Lord, 
if you trust in his all-sufficiency to save you from your sin and from death, know that he alone has made this a reality. All glory must go to God. And last thing, faith is the means that this redeeming grace of God is applied. Those who continue the path of rebellion against God and who trust in themselves will one day be silenced before his judgment and will face his full wrath. But to those who trust in him, they will receive the alien righteousness of Christ that will absolve them of all their sin and guilt and put it onto the cross of Christ uh, where they can be forgiven. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your gospel. And thank you that you identified us as we are. Thank you that you don't, do not leave us where we are. But I pray that you would help us to see ourselves clearly in light of what you've done. Help us to see how we cannot measure up, uh, how we have failed, and help us to submit ourselves to your mercy and submit ourselves to Christ in faith. Thank you for your loving mercy. Thank you for teaching us. Pray that you would apply these words to our hearts and minds and continue to shape us into the image of Christ. We pray this all in your name.